Hey guys, Dr. A here. I thought I would um, do a short recording on Moffitt's dual taxonomy. I got most of my notes from this book here. Ooh, it's mirrored. I'm not quite sure how to change that, but basically um, criminological theory by um, Lily Cullen and Ball. Okay, and it's chapter 12. I will be, um, in class, we use the Vold book. The theories don't really change. It just has to do with the method of presentation. So we'll see how it goes. Um, the, the slides um, are presented here in the video. You can pause it, do whatever you want from it, take whatever notes. This is also the first time I have tried Zoom. So, um, you know, it can be a little tricky. Of course, just for some fun, you can always just choose a different background. Um, you know, and I can unmirror my video. And I mean, that's actually pretty cool. But I don't want you guys getting sick. So I'm going to stop fooling around. All right, I'm going to share my screen. And we can start talking about, huh, I did not know that my face would still be here. All right, fair enough. Try not to do anything weird. Okay, so let's see. Developmental theories. I'm going to just go very briefly into um, some of the things that I think are important when considering developmental theories, and then we'll talk, or I will talk, and you guys will listen about um, um, Moffat's dual taxonomy. All right, so a couple of things to think about when we're considering uh, developmental theories of crime. It is one of the things that are you know, one of the most agreed upon ideas regarding crime is that the, um, the teenage years are where delinquency tends to spike, okay? It's when we see high rates of antisociality, illegal behaviors, and Caspian and Moffat point out something really interesting, that, um, even though during teenage years, okay, we have this um, spike in um, criminal offenders or delinquent offenders, most of them desist by um, their early 30s. So we see a, a decline, and this is true, and I've always found this fascinating. Take a look at this graph, and even though the peak index numbers at the top differ, you can really see here that um, the trend tends to be the same, where we see a big spike in late adolescence and then a decline as, um, as the delinquents, as the individuals um, desist from crime. So, I thought we'd just do a brief revisit to um, the age crime curve. Also, uh, define a few key concepts that are going to be useful in um, thinking about uh, developmental theories and thinking about how to um, make sense of this uh, idea that crime changes and that delinquency changes. I need my hit of coffee. Okay, so age crime curve, all right? Peak during, at, during the teenage years, desistance. So a couple of things, onset, all right? There is general consensus that the earlier the onset into antisocial behavior, delinquent behavior, the worse the prognosis in terms of later delinquency, okay? Then we have the persistence, which is basically the continuation 
of crime. And I'm not going to, this is a theories class, I'm not going to go into in-depth discussion of how we um, operationalize or conceptualize persistence and desistance. Um, because it will depend on how we want to measure it. It will depend on how we choose to conceptualize it. And that goes beyond um, what I want to focus on here. And then we have Lambda, which I routinely forget to put the B in, which then in my head makes me say Lambda. Anyway, this is just the frequency, how often an individual um, engages in antisocial behavior, engages in delinquency, and then you um, measure it by some sort of time period. And then desistance, the process of either um, reducing your lambda, meaning you start to um, engage in crime at a uh, slower rate, or whether you completely desist in one fell swoop. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, Moffat's dual taxonomy. All right, I um, I'm a big fan of first discussing what this a, a few a few points regarding this um, this theorist this researcher. I mean, academics are human; they have stories, and this book I have no it's no longer mirrored has a great story about how. Um, how Terry Moffat became interested, if you will, in, um, in crime and studying crime. So I thought it was really um, interesting to kind of get some insight into her own kind of story, if you will. here trying to kind of get all right so Terry Moffat was a um, is well at, at the time she was a grad student in um, just trying to figure out some of the things trying to do here on my computer all right so technical diff difficulties figured out um, I always find it fascinating. So there's this little um, description that, you know, she trained as a clinical psychologist. She was in grad school, I believe it was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she wanted to do, she wanted to follow a career as a hospital clinical psychologist. And um, she, in 1984, she was involved in a parachuting accident and broke her leg. And so she was confined to a wheelchair. And so confined to a wheelchair, confined to her office, kind of like what a lot of us are facing today, you know, in today's world. And, um, you know, she was writing, she was writing her dissertation and the department had a guest, um, kind of visitor, academic visitor, who persuaded her to travel to New Zealand and spend the next two years um, conducting neuropsychological battery tests on this um, cohort, the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health um, and Development Study. So for those of you that are going to then um, you know, follow, uh, follow the, like, the um, Samson and Lobb's informal social control theory. This was an important turning point in her life. So she moved to New Zealand and started um, conducting neuropsych tests on these kids. So the Dunedin multidisciplinary uh, study is a longitudinal study that looks at um, health, development, and behavior for these for these kids. And so all kids born between April 1st, 1972 and March 31st, 1973. And what makes it a really rich data set is that it includes pre and perinatal data. So data from the moms during their pregnancy and um, 
following birth of the child and then follow, these kids were followed through adult. And what um, Terry Moffat has this great quote and basically she states, to my horror, as more and more adolescents in the, in the cohort joined the ranks of offending at age 15 and 18, the correlations between risk factors and delinquency became weaker and weaker until she had no findings at all to publish. So what it indicated was that what we believed were correlates or you know, strong predictors or strong risk factors for delinquency um, slowly started to att diminish or attenuate. And, you know, following several years, I mean, think about 1984, 1980, you know, two years. So she then um, started to think about the um, age crime curve is actually deceptive, okay? And what it really does contain are two types of um, potential offenders, the, what she termed as the life course persister and, the adol and then the adolescent limited. Um, and, you know, fun fact, she said, from what I've read online and what I've heard, um, she submitted the first dual taxonomy paper to one of our top journals and it got rejected and then it ended up getting published in another journal. So those of you that ever want to have a theory, there's hope for you yet. And, you know, basically this idea is that there are two types of um, delinquents, if you will. Those who seem to onset early in delinquent behavior and then follow a fairly stable trajectory across their life course. Um, and then there's also the adolescent limited who tend to focus most of their deviant behavior during the adolescent period. Now, when thinking about what type of theory, if you're thinking it, whether it's typological, macro, and micro, this is primarily, a, it, it's viewed from the individual level. We take a look at the, diff, the two different categories of offenders, okay? Now, beyond their differences in terms of the antisocial career path, if you will. Um, there are distinct differences in terms of the types of behaviors that uh, life course persisters and adolescent limiteds engage in. And we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about each one individually. Okay, so just a graphic to kind of really um, bring home the idea that they're just two different um, types of delinquent, if you will. All right, so this is directly from Moffat's article. Okay, we have prevalence of antisocial behavior, a strong predictor of um, later delinquency. And um, so the adolescent limited, or I'll start with the life course persister, apparently. So life course persisters, let's go back. They onset earlier on and tend to follow a particularly, whoops, stable criminal career over the life course. And then we have the adolescent limited who tend to onset primarily during teenage years. They reach a peak in late adolescence, early um, adulthood, and then they slowly desist as they get all over, okay? Um, Moffat suggests that the adolescent limited have a much shorter time span in terms of um, their criminal career. Okay, now let's talk about the life course persister. This is just a graph, if you will, or, or that basically um, uh, to show you the different types of behaviors that the life course persister may or may not engage in to indicate um, their uh, criminal career path, if you will. And also to, to kind of show you that these are age appropriate behaviors that they engage in, age appropriate deviant behaviors that they engage in. 
So some char characteristics, they onset early, they tend to persist, okay? And it's key that um, you also understand that this, the, the life course persisters are made up of a very small group of persistent offenders. A majority of kids will desist. All right, and so some of the behaviors that we see, okay, they start off with, um, you know, not necessarily delinquent, but deviant behaviors. And this is where having four kids really comes in handy. A two-year-old that bites, totally normal. A two-year-old two that hits, totally normal. It's when they start aging and they continue on in these behaviors of biting and hitting and being aggressive that um, there's a potential indication that something might not be quite right. You know, and then they start engaging in behaviors that are more um, concerning. You know, at 10, they become truant and steal and notice that truant or truancy is a, um, it, it isn't so much of a big deal because once they reach um, a certain age, truancy is no longer, um, no longer criminal. So it's just a status offense where, you know, drinking alcohol, truancy, buying cigarettes, these are all just status offenses that once you reach a certain developmental stage, a, de a certain developmental age, these no longer become um, deviant. And then, you know, they start taking drugs, steal cars, they might progress to more violent forms of, of deviance, rape, rob, fro uh, fraud, child abuse, okay? So this is just a diagr diagrammatic representation of the um, trajectory or the types of crimes that the life course persister might engage in, okay? Which brings us to the model of the life course persister. Okay, so it starts with poor prenatal and perinatal care. Okay, um, you know, pregnancy, the, the, the pre-birth period when women are pregnant, there are certain things that we are supposed to be mindful of or careful of, um, alcohol intake, vitamin intake, food intake, drug intake. And so what happens is, um, you know, women who are exposed to some environmental conditions who engage in riskier behaviors, either for a variety of reasons, and I'm not going to get into any kind of um, discussion about that, but these conditions or these, this poor prenatal and perinatal care, all right, it are often involved or often um, influenced by contextual hardships. And things that we don't necessarily think about, and I know this was in, in the 1970s, but routine blood work, routine taking of, the blood, of blood pressure during pregnancy, uh, diagnosing whether or not a mom has um, gestational diabetes. These are all things that um, in a healthier world, we would want all pregnant women to get, but it's not something that is um, readily available to all. I'll give you guys an example. When I had my first child, I didn't have health insurance and I went in for my first prenatal appointment and I paid $1,500. The HIV test alone was, I think, 400, which pissed me off because I could have just gone to the University Health Center and had it for free. Anyway, these are the kinds of things that can kind of affect the development of the fetus and potentially all right, potentially lead to um, problems, behavioral problems. So, all right, Moffat's theory suggests that, um, you know, poor prenatal, perinatal care can lead to neuropsych deficits. All right, and one of the things that um, I want to be mindful of is that the neurodeficits in and of themselves don't necessarily cause criminal behavior, all right? Neuropsych deficits can include dyslexia, for example, ADD, ADHD, um, can impede the kid's ability to communicate effectively. And um, 
you know, criminal, as criminologists, we recognize that academic competence is one of the uh, strongest predictors of, um, you know, of a, a child keep it, uh, staying in school, getting their high school diploma. And so because of these neuropsych deficits, all right, these kids tend to experience behavioral issues, okay? It is also important to recognize that um, there are multi-levels to this relationship. Reactive parenting. Oftentimes we tend to look at the one-way direction between parenting and deviant behavior, moving from supervision, harsh disciplining. But the truth is parenting can be a reactive experience where parents react to the child's behavior and then the child behavior react and the child uh, reacts to the parent. And so there's this feedback loop that can uh, sometimes be very difficult to manage and difficult to break. Other things to consider as well, the contextual hardships. So if you, if, if a family is in financial dire straits, if they are unable to provide, for example, um, you know, medical care or the need for uh, extra learning, um, extra tutoring, um, uh, prescriptions for, um, for example, um, ADHD medication, the advoc advocate, for example, for um, extra time because the child has a form, uh, a mild or severe learning disability. And it's also important to contextualize Moffitt's study in the 70s. Let me tell you, there wasn't this like, oh, you know, this, the child's dyslexic, they need um, extra time on the exam or they need alternative accommodations. I had a friend who was severely dyslexic and he kept getting U's on his English exams. And U meant ungradable because it was so bad. And for me, I was like, I don't understand it. He's got dyslexia, obviously his spelling. And this was pre-computers. I just aged myself. Anyways, I was born after the Dunedin multidisciplinary um, study. But it does, it does go, go to show that there weren't the societal supports necessary to overcome the obstacles that these neuropsych deficits led to. And there's also a financial um, component whereby if parents didn't have the means to provide that additional help, then this is where we, we see um, an aggravation, if you will, of the behavioral issues. Also important to consider cont the contextual hardships of reactive parenting. And I think this is something that will resonate with a lot of people during this process of social distancing and social isolation. Um, you know, when parents have to work several jobs, when they're unable to help kids with their homework because they're exhausted, I mean, there can be this exacerbation of, um, of negative outcomes, if you will, tensions, aggression, and inappropriate responses to situations that are not as dire, or not as serious, but there aren't the appropriate social mechanisms, there aren't the social supports to help these kids overcome some of these problems. And so uh, oftentimes what happens is these behavioral repertoire um, repertoire, oh, sorry, these behavioral issues lead to what, are, what is known as a restricted, a restricted behavior repertoire, meaning when many of us are triggered or when many of us um, experience, you know, a difficulty, a, a task that we are unable to do, a comment from a colleague or a classmate or mate or a professor who you know just doesn't sit well with us, we have a host of tools at our disposal. We can ignore it, we can write a nasty email, feel better about ourselves and then delete it. We can speak calmly to the person and say, look, dude, 
not cool. Let's talk about this. Let's iron out our difficulties. The problem emerges when a kid doesn't have that toolbox and, and tend or, you know, they don't have the tools to effectively communicate their response or communicate their needs. And so violence or aggression becomes one of their main to go tools. Okay. I always use this little video as an example. Most of the time students don't recognize it, but I'm going to give it a shot unless of course it Okay, so it's Allie McBeal. That's her way of dealing with stress. She like, eh, I wanted to go back. Because in truth, this is the deal. Let me just, I want to close this. I don't want to open it again. Um, go back to where you came from. All right. And so a lot of us can often, I mean, okay, I won't say a lot of us, I don't know about you, but I, I often am in meetings or hanging out with people that will irritate me or say something that will make me angry or make me triggered. And I will imagine biting off their head like Ali McBeal, we just don't do it because we have a series of tools. We have self-control, we have communication tools. But for these kids, for the life course persister, they don't have access to these tools. And it leads to what Moffat identifies as contemporary continuity. So continuity in these behaviors, okay? Now, the lack of tools or lack of appropriate responses to the restricted behavior repertoire leads to what are known as snares or traps or pitfalls, okay? And basically the idea that you have a, let's say that you have a learning disability, that a life course persister has a learning disability and therefore they struggle in school. <clears throat> Those individuals are much more likely to um, drop out. Okay, they drop out of high school, they don't complete their secondary education, which then limits their um, employment uh, prospects. Okay, in addition to the, um, the, hang on, I need to, okay, and so a couple of things, these snares, the education, there's the educational component. There can also be drug involvement where, um, you know, the, the hyperactivity, the um, irritability, the low cognitive ability are offset by drug use, which then can lead to drug addiction, which can then lead to um, what Moffat identifies as unsavory outcomes or just negative outcomes, meaning um, the drug addiction, the, if, for example, for um, female um, life course persisters, unwanted pregnancy or early initiation of sexual relations. And keep in mind, I'm not saying that, oh, you get pregnant during high school, it's the end of the world. But if you also consider all of the issues, all right, and, and, and the difficulty related to, um, handling all of these momentous life events, it can um, cascade into greater problems. And then the un unsavory outcomes, the drug addiction, in the case of the United States, a felony conviction that will then disenfranchise you often for life, the inability to get a job, and to really get out of this um, what Moffat identifies as this cumulative continuity, all right, being unable to break the cycle and then therefore unable to um, desist, okay? And so a lot of the times, you know, basically the opportunities for change, okay, the opportunities for desistance 
whether it is a job, an education, um, these snares, these traps, and then the outcomes associated with these um, snares tend to snip away at opportunities that the life course persisters have for um, desisting from crime, from leaving their, um, their criminal pathway and turning away from it. And so that is what really leads to this continuity, if you will, of um, criminal behavior. Which now brings me to the Adolescent Limited. Okay, so Adolescent Limited, they have uh, adolescent onset. So these kids onset during adolescence, during their teenage years, um, discontinuity or desistance. So it, it, it basically occurs during a, a, a part of their teenage years, but then it stops as they um, grow older. There is a widespread pre prevalence, and I always use the example of, you know, things we do as, as teens. We try alcohol, we might smoke a cigarette, we break curfew, we take a car out for a drive without our license, we shoplift. These are all things that we um, might engage in, and not me personally, during our teenage years, but then um, we stop. I always use the example of, um, because students provide this example for me, going, for example, to Chipotle and getting the water cup, but then filling it with Sprite or 7-Up. You haven't actually paid for it. It is a behavior that is technically deviant. However, um, once you reach a certain age, we tend to not engage in that behavior. I always think of, for example, going for free refills at fast food joints when there aren't actually free refills. And that, um, you know, once you reach a certain age, there's no reason why you shouldn't be paying for your own refill. For the most part, these kids don't have any neuropsych deficits. Okay, most kids don't have neuropsych deficits. And really what happens is what is known as the maturity gap. So whereas um, for the life course persister, the neuropsych deficits trigger a series of cumulative ev events that um, disadvantage them over their lifespan, with adolescent limited, the primary driving factor in terms of engaging in delinquent behavior is the maturity gap, okay? Adolescence, I always ask students, what does, what does it mean? What does adolescence actually mean? What is, and, and they're like puberty, and then that's where things get awkward and weird. But yeah, so puberty, the onset of puberty, which occurs in adolescence, is basically when we become biologically mature. Okay, we become biological mature, biologically mature, which means we are capable of sexual reproduction, we are capable of um, sexual behaviors, and then at the same time, there is this drive towards autonomy, this search for independence, this need to assert our own um, personhood. And um, is this maturity gap where uh, we, the adolescent feels that they have achieved that independence or you know, believe that they're now independent and have all these you know, weird hormonal things going on. And yet society tends to quash all of these feelings, emotions, and behaviors, and that leads to the maturity gap. And, you know, for the most part, the adolescent limited have what you know, be considered a relatively stable. I am, however, of the mind that I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to mean nowadays, relatively stable, but, um, you know, relatively stable. There's no evidence of neuropsych deficits, um, but when the, when kids, when all of us reach adolescence, all right, society is structured in such a way, and, and again, this is another thing I tell my students, and they all just get grossed out, but 
200 years ago, as soon as someone, as soon as an individual reached um, puberty, they were off getting married and having babies, mostly because people tended to die early on. I, I think I'd probably be considered age ancient if we went back a couple of hundred years. But nowadays, in today's society, okay, modern society is structured to control these behaviors, to kind of dampen, or in some cases, shame behaviors that are natural biological impulses. So the body is like, go, go, go. And society is like, no, no, no. And yeah, you know, part of growing up and this maturity gap, this desire to be independent, this desire to achieve autonomy leads to difficulties in the individual, in the, in the, in the kid. And one way of dealing with these difficulties, this search for autonomy, the, this power struggle, is to engage in deviant behavior. Okay, deviant behavior tends to be an adaptable behavior and a way in which kids can assert their um, independence. Now, deviant behavior, like, most of the behaviors that we tend to engage in, all right, um, is a learned process. We learn. And one of the ways that we learn is through social mimicry. I am at this point, and this social isolation might be driving me crazy at some point, where my kids are doing the renegade dance from TikTok and trying to figure out who has the best one that they have imitated from TikTok. We can apply that analogy to social mimicry. When we are adolescents and, and experiencing this flow of hormones, these behaviors, these opportunities, one um, way is through social mimicry. And we tend to social, we tend to imitate, if you will, or model um, those who we feel um, have achieved that independence, have achieved that autonomy. Um, as kids, uh, you know, we, some of us, when they still, I think they even still have it, the um, chocolate cigarettes it seemed cool to pretend that you were smoking that chocolate cigarette or that Italian breadstick that you, that you get at the restaurant. Mim imitating the life course persister becomes so much more appealing. Okay. They seem to have greater uh, allure. They seem to have greater independence. They do what they want. They don't seem to be held back by any social controls. So I use the example of Sandy from Greece, where she doesn't seem to have found her voice. And you know, one way that she does find her voice is, where is it? There she is clearly piercing her ears and wearing pleather is one way that she imitated the bad boys um, in the movie, okay? And, you know, social mimicry, so the, 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 this, you know, imitating of the, um, of the life, life course per sister works to a certain extent to kind of alleviate the pressures of the maturity gap of wanting to be a grown up yet and being biologically mature but not socially intellectually or emotionally mature and as and and, and we can see that for example with um, girls like female adolescent limiteds so girls enter puberty earlier than boys do and you know girls who enter puberty earlier on, all right, are the ones that tend to get attention from the older, from older delinquent boys. They wear bras earlier on, they develop physically earlier on. And sometimes what this can do is it can cause social isolation from the peers. This is where you know, we see, and from my brief experience with my oldest, um, foray into middle school. She's in the sixth grade. And um, this is when 
you know, kids become assholes. And, um, you know, this, there's a lot of social isolation, particularly for the girls that develop earlier. This is where we see labels of um, slut and slut shaming and, and a lot of this bull crap. And um, essentially these girls, they eventually experience this waning motivation because as girls, as other girls catch up to them, okay, as all the girls eventually enter puberty, okay, they start to desist from these, this, this type of, of behavior. Um, they no longer need to um, break curfew, for example. They no longer need to act in certain more mature ways because all of a sudden all the barriers that existed early on they start dissolving away certain things happen as they grow older as they mature so for example depending on the state in which you live the age at which they can get their first job okay the, then that progresses to getting a driver's license then that so 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 slowly society starts to recognize the autonomy and independence of these individuals, they can then start, you know, they acquire the right to vote. Then at 21, they are able to drink and, you know, go to college, graduate. And what happens is, is that um, as they achieve these developmental liberties, the desire or the need to engage in crime or to engage in adaptive behavior to address this maturity gap, they start to dissolve away and disappear. So they experience this declining, waning motivation to engage in crime. And then eventually it leads to this idea of shifting contingencies where it's no longer worth it. It's, it, it makes no sense. I always liken it to the idea of, you know, why am I getting a water cup at Chipotle when I can just pay the dollar or whatever, $2 uh, and, and just get my own drink. And it, it's not worth it to me to, you know, get called out at Chipotle and, um, or any other of those, of course, the students will tell me that it's always worth it because the drinks are too expensive, but that's a totally different theory that we can discuss. Um, you know, neutralization theory is a good one for that behavior. And basically, as, as we mature, as kids mature out from, from beyond adolescence, they then become, um, they, have shifting priorities. I often liken it to Jackson Toby's stakes and conformity. You now have so much more to lose if you do engage in the deviant behavior that you tend to shift your priorities into more pro-social endeavors. Now, a word to the wise, this doesn't mean that adolescent limiteds cannot or won't become life course persisters, okay? Because this social mimicry can get them into situations or into those snares with the unsavory outcomes that life course persisters experience. So for example, experimentation with drugs during the social mimicry phase, um, you know, failing your SATs or cheating on an exam or potential pitfalls where I'll give you another example. I always use this example of asking students if you've ever dr driven under the influence. And I don't ask for people to raise their hands, but you know, if we consider how many have actually driven under the influence and then how many actually got into an accident, knock on wood, or you know, something terrible happened, these are the snares that can have unsavory outcomes for both the life course persister, but also for the adolescent limited, which then let's say, you know, you get drunk, you get in a car, you accidentally get into it, you, you, you crash and you kill someone. If you get charged with negligent homicide, end up with a felony conviction, then you end up 
with that cumulative um, that cumulative process, if you will, that cumulative continuity that will then uh, affect your the potential outcome of your life course and therefore contribute to long term difficulties. All right, now evaluating. I usually look in, in terms of acres. Um, Aker's criteria for what a good theory is. Does it have logical consistency? Sure. I mean, it does make sense that there are different groups in terms of their uh, deviant behavior. We also have the scope. Well, it, it is broad enough because it is able to capture those who continue on in a life of crime and those who are limited to a particular period in their life course. Parsimony, to be honest, this was never my favorite in grad school. I mean, criminal behavior is not parsimonious. Causal factors are not parsimonious. And so I wouldn't say it is particularly parsimonious, especially if we go back to all this. But I also don't think it's the biggest fatal flaw in terms of Moffat's theory. Um, testability, if you have the data, it is testable. Um, you can refute some of the hypotheses. And the good thing about Moffat is that she has been updating the theory. All right, it's a rich data set, Danita, and, and so you can really kind of get into the meat, into the nitty gritty of the theory and really test it and see um, whether or not these, um, whether the hypotheses still hold true, empirical validity, if you have longitudinal cohort data, it should be testable if you have access to the data. And it is useful. I mean, kids, for example, nowadays, there are Head Start programs. There are special um, paraeducators to help kids overcome any type of learning disability. There is integration in the schools. So it did provide a, a great deal of utility in terms of dealing in terms of helping kids overcome, okay, these um, potential neuropsych or learning disabilities that could impact the rest of their uh, life course. Okay, some of the limitations. Now, what about LCPs without uh, neuropsych deficit? Well, we've talked about, you know, some of those. Um, Nagan and Land have a 1993, 1993 piece where they identified the never convicted. They use statistical modeling and, you know, I have just a little bit of an issue with the never convicted because I'd rather have never onset. The problem is, is it's really difficult to actually find someone who's never done anything deviant. And by anything deviant, I mean, it can be literally anything, not necessarily criminal or delinquent, but just deviant. And then even uh, Moffat in a kind of reconsideration or revamp of her, um, of her theory said that even LCPs eventually age out of crime. I mean, you have to, even if it's not, if, even if it's just physically. And, you know, she did also include two additional groups. So the non-starters, so adolescent limiteds who have actually never even onset into antisocial behavior and low chronics, those who aren't, you know, engage in, in, in minor stuff throughout their life course and things that don't act, impact as severely their trajectory. All right, that's it. Let me stop, if I stop sharing. Oh, cool. So that's my um, Moffat lecture. And, and that's it. Thank you.